My name is Hetty. Waltham. I'm 13. In my family, there are Ra and Lucy, the twins. And then there's Ruby, my older sister. And then there's Lisa, who is my mother. And then Steve, who is my father. I'm also an actor. I am playing the part of Stella Tarrant in Mr. I can't hear any either of my ears unless I've got my coculars on. For all I know, everyone's voices are completely different to how I hear them. I mean, it doesn't really affect my brain or anything. It's just I can't hear. <laughs> I identify as non-binary, and I personally go by, like, they, them. I think it's decently tight. I don't know, because I don't have enough of family to compare it to. I, I would say they support me. I live in Dunedin, but I travel up to Auckland to film Mystic. The filming days are very long. Morning, Hattie. Morning. Morning, Hattie. Morning. Depending on, like, the shooting day, obviously, I have to get out of bed at, like, 5 in the morning to get there on time. It's because it will, like, start at 7, and it's, like, we're, like, two hours away from wherever we are. And then sometimes, I think the latest was 10 that I got back. Not quite yet. Yeah. Well, she, she has a small window to grab some breakfast. Yeah. I'm Ray, and my job on Mystics is to chaperone Eddie. They come in, they get processed, which means they step some wardrobe, they get dressed for her first scene, they then step into makeup. It's not bad getting up in the morning. It's just kind of like, oh, yay. And then you realize that you might have accidentally slept in, and you're just like, they've only got two scenes. They're all near outside. People don't realise Hattie has her cochlear implants. She can talk and generally hear well if she's lip reading off people's lips. But if you're beside her or behind her, she may not hear you properly. Occasionally I have to remind someone that like I'm deaf and that they need to like either stop mumbling, even though I'm really bad at with mumbling as well, or talking really fast. And this is what the finished show looks like. And Mystic's a ghost. Yes. No. More like a spirit. Most of the time, I live in Dunedin with my family. Come on, Hattie, you need to get up. You're going to be late for school. Me and my mother, we, like, talk a lot about random things. Like, when I'm, like, getting ready for, like, sleep, like, she'll come in to, like, say goodnight, and then we would just, like, end up being strict and, like, talk for, like, another hour, and we'd be like, oh, I'm supposed to go to sleep. Whoops. <laughs> we have fights like every other family does, but we say the funniest things, we have the funniest conversations. We're just really close. <laughs> I'm Lucy. I'm Ra. We're twins. Yeah. We're both eight, but we're nine in a month. Uh, Hattie is deaf, and they are also non-binary. People who are, like, identify as non-binary, they, like, choose whatever pronouns they see... Well, they don't choose, like, they have pronouns that they see fit for themselves, and they will, like, want to, like, use those pronouns and, like, ask other people to use those pronouns for them. And I personally go by, like, they, them. And I've got, like, a pin over there. It's over there, not over there. And then i got my non-binary flag up there, obviously. Steve, what have you got your iPad at the table? Yeah. I didn't even know what non-binary was. I Googled it and got a whole lot of math stuff. I think as parents, well, it is it is Hattie's choice. Um, we're not going to demand something different. Hattie has discovered themselves. They're creating themselves as a person and that's part of being a teenager. You find who you are and that's what Hattie's doing. Um, no cats in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, no cats in the kitchen. They don't do something like any normal person would do. They cut their hair short and they dyed it green and um, they have a really cool style and clothing. They're unique. It is our second child and they were born 2008, 7th of April. 
I didn't know that Hattie was profoundly deaf. Like, I thought maybe it was something like glue ear or even, you know, single-sided deafness, which at that time I didn't think was a big deal. Particularly, I noticed that if I went out and came home, if Hattie was facing me, she was all smiles, but if I called her name, she would ignore me. The doctor just told me that she was too happy and too smart and too confident to have anything wrong with the hearing, which is pretty disappointing. The Plunkett nurse was someone who'd come out of retirement and she said, you know, you need to go back to your doctor. And I went in there and he told me that he thought I was being ridiculous and he rolled his eyes at me and he said, but I will refer you anyway. We weren't expecting the news we got. They just came out and they said, you know, like, we're really sorry, but Hattie's profoundly deaf in her left ear and we think that the right ear is the same. When you do sort of get to that realisation, you've sort of got absolutely no idea what to do next. The whole process felt very, very slow until we got referred to SCIP, which is the Southern Cochlear Institute program in Christchurch. The surgeon was absolutely brilliant and it was sort of a whirlwind. And then the next thing we know, we're down in Christchurch for the mm. surgery. Well, um, the cochlear implant program were just incredible. I have cochlears. It's like Bluetooth to my ears, so it's like listen to music without having to like get like headphones, which can be a problem when people don't know when you're listening to music or not, and you're like, wait, oh, give me like a minute. <laughs> I gotta find my phone so I can pause the music. <laughs> So this is like the part where like the noise goes in and then this part's the part that the FM connects to. And then this connects to my head because it's got a magnet. When they switched on, you could literally see Hattie's eyes opening wide as all of a sudden these sounds. And it's at a very, very low level when they first switched on because they slowly, gradually build it up. And just looking at everything, it was actually, it was quite amazing. There's actually a cochlear t-shirt that says, hello, greetings, regular human being. I am a CI book cochlear implant, like cochlear implant high tech person. It is quite cool. I should probably finish reading this one, so I'll probably put this one in the bag. Nice bed making. I can't hear in either of my ears unless I've got my cochleas on. I don't like it because it's like very buzzy and loud because my voice is like screaming at me. I don't know if that's the same for all people who can't hear them when they take out their ears. Our perception of deafness has changed so much with cochlear implants. People have this idea that they're like a pair of glasses and you put them on and it's all sorted. So sometimes I think it makes it harder because people aren't thinking about getting Hattie's attention first or not having something in front of their mouth or background noise. At times, Hattie has been quite self-conscious about being deaf. Deaf children miss things, and of course, people don't think about it because they seem to be getting every little little thing and, and the talking. It looks very pretty, though. Thank you. Hattie's speech has always been very, very clear all the way through, and she learned very early on as a smile and nod, whether you understood the question or not, was one way for people to sort of move on, which was really frustrating as parents, where you're actually wanting them to ask <laughs> for clarity. With your new cochlea, when you get to school, you need to take the other one off and test the FM to make sure it's paired with your FM, OK? Lisa's been absolutely fantastic at going in and actually almost educating the teachers. In an ideal world, you'd have support to do that. We had this child that had been learning like the speed of light and suddenly had turned up to school and was just not learning at all and was quite almost depressed. I'm happy that my mum does that because I would have as much things as I do today. I probably would miss out on a lot more things. So I'm like happy that she pushes me to do certain things. Since we've been in Dunedin, every single teacher that Hattie has had in Dunedin has almost been a once in a lifetime teacher. It's like incredibly grateful that they have had these amazing teachers. Morning, Hattie. You're speaking proper just now. <laughs> the teacher's good. I like the way he like sets up the classroom and stuff, and how he like does things. It's good, and he's quite funny too. Is it working? Yeah. It's an FM, and it just sort of transmits to the teacher's voice directly to their ears. Kia ora, Hattie. 
Kill them to us. If the teacher doesn't wear the microphone, but they're talking, but the class isn't talking, then I can hear them like quite well, but not like super well. Like it's like it's more muffled. And then if like the class is talking well, I can't hear them at all. People at school are quite good with it. Like obviously, there's times we have to like remind people and stuff. What game are we going to be playing? Uh, Non-stop non dodgeball. So we need to take the dodgeballs down. Okay, fuck it, Arangi. Do you want me to leave this on or turn it off? Because I could talk to you going down the stairs. Off. You sure? Off. Are you sure? Off. off or on? Off, 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 on. It is certainly a lot harder with a deaf child to get to their potential. Right now, they're definitely doing very, very well. Well then, no! <laughs> when I meet someone, they occasionally figure out, or like, because I mention, like, I make a joke about it. Like, the other day, someone was, like, during class or something, someone was just like, why is no one listening? And I'm like, yeah, well, lot, some of us struggle with that. <laughs> And they're like, oh, wait, yeah, you're deaf, aren't you? I'm like, mm. <laughs> Stella, you had me worried there for a moment. I know. I was impressed. Nice writing. I play Stella. She's deaf and she, like, rides her horse, Coco. One of the perks being deaf. When we first moved to Dunedin, Ruby started drama. And then I thought it looked fun, so I decided to do some drama for, like, a year and one term. <laughs> My acting coach is a great woman called Cindy. <laughs> All of our kids have gone through drama and with Interact with Cindy over the years. Hattie is included amongst that and everything. And we create a reasonably good friendship with Cindy. And it's a wee bit like you're the track. I met Hattie when she was just seven when she joined our classes and she was the first time I've actually worked with anyone who had hearing loss and I think it was a, definitely an eye-opening for me just how strong-willed and totally capable she was. You are a jellyfish. You have the least tension of anyone possible. Cindy rang up Lisa and pretty much said to Lisa, look, is Hattie about 15 and can she ride a horse? And Lisa said, no, I've never been on a horse since she's 11. And so Cindy said, close enough, we'll get her to audition for this, um, this part that's coming up. What is that over there and do, can I eat it? And to me thinking that I wasn't going to get it, I was just like, oh yeah, that could be fun. And so we auditioned for it and then we got the call back and I was like, huh? <laughs> what? Next, a guard dog. Who are you looking at? Squirrel! It was one of those funny things where I didn't think she had a passion for theatre, like some kids do, they, you know, I'm going to be a famous star. She was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I can do it. And she did. Do that one though, because it has a few lines. It's good to be able to say that I've auditioned for it. I didn't get a call back, but that's part of it though. And then Hattie got the part a while later, then went to Auckland. It was probably quite hard for her because she'd been like doing drama for six years at a time, and I've only done for like two years. Well, one and a quarter. <sighs> It's like she'd been doing it for longer, and then I got the part, and she was just like, oh, good for you. <laughs> I really wanted it, but I was so happy for them that they got something so exciting, and they were going to experience that. The chicken farm one would be a good one to do. Since that was actually really tricky. Ruby was really amazing, though. At one stage, Hattie just kind of came to me and said, look, you know, I've decided I don't want to do this anymore. And it turned out that it was actually all about Ruby, which was actually just kind of really lovely, but then opened that dialogue between the two of them. Hold up, Stella. I'll come with you. Why can I go on my own? I, no, I know, but this horse rustler guy might not come back, and I've still got heaps of things to do with Tom. Come on, then. I'll walk you back. Ruby will, like, help me with my lines if, like, I need to learn them. I like go into her room and be like, Ruby, can you help me learn my lines? She's like, oh, you're so needy. <laughs> we might start with you two. Please everyone pull my fucky fucky. Cindy's son Harrison also turned out to have a hearing difficulty, just like me. Harrison's hearing loss became apparent to us when he was about four and a half, and we thought he had glue ear. We got an appointment for two weeks later. They went in and he came back out and he said, we've put the grommets in his left ear, but we can't put grommets in his right ear because there is a massive cyst, which has probably been growing for a while. And so they cut the whole cyst out, but that meant that he had no way of sound getting to the cochlea. Then they went back in a year later to do just a quick sweep pass to make sure it was all gone and it had all grown back but in a different part of the year. And so cut them up back in, dig it out, and that's happened for five years. So every time they've gone back in, 
it is it basically it's an incredibly aggressive little skin cyst that just keeps finding a home. Luckily for Cindy, my mum had been through this journey with me. Lisa, she was really pragmatic and amazing, and she gave me her number, and we and we talked heaps, and she kind of talked me through some of the processes of the health systems and what was available, and also about how to prep the school. It's surprising, because then another parent of a newly diagnosed child will go, and people just keep staring all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's right. Yeah, Having Lisa as a friend and a kind of a mentor of how to advocate in the, especially the school system, because I never even thought of that kind of stuff about how to prep the school to better facilitate his hearing loss. I found that so invaluable. I can see where Hattie gets it from. She's a strong character. And I was like, um, I can't ask the teachers to, you know, I can't ask the teachers to treat him differently. And so she's been great over the years being able to kind of have a cordial about um, issues that we've had. Hearing aid in Mitre 10. How's it all going with Harrison? Good. Good, we've got surgery again on Monday. This will be his 11th. Surgery. The constant fight of saying to people, stick a finger in your ear and walk around all day. How tired are you at the end of the day of trying to hear where sounds are coming from, doing all this? It is exhausting. How did it work with your meeting with the agent the other day? Oh, really good, but yeah, we've still got a few things to do until it's all official. Like we've got to get, you know, photos and stuff done and voice stuff. When Hattie goes back this time, she'll have a, they will have a much better idea or what they're going into. Yeah. And I think it won't be as exhausting because they will know oh. a little bit more about taking those breaks and, and how much is expected. I fear that the adult schedule might be a wee bit hard on them, but I think they'll I think they will push their way through with that <laughs> classic stubbornness. Right. How many tissues do you reckon you need? Having your deaf child a shift up to Auckland for Several months is, a, is not the most common thing to happen, it's a bit daunting. The education piece was actually a big part of it, a bit of a winner for us because it did enable Hattie to have one-on-one -on -one teaching. If I got a chunk of the afternoon free, then I would like have this tutor person. We like look at the school work and then we like go off from there. We can focus on like the things that I need to work on rather than the things that like everyone needs to work on. But it might be handy to have more charges just for on set for in your green room too. I think it would be hard to be deaf and be on a TV show. All that oversized luggage that I have to pay for when I come <laughs> back, I'm going to start charging you for that soon. When Hattie first went up for the, the production start, Lisa went up there just ensuring that the people that we're going to be working with Hattie understood um, communication tips, just some of the basics, um, basic rules, but also when when to communicate, how to communicate um, with the whole crew. I, everything kind of goes very fast. So I'm just like, oh, I'm back to Indonesia. How did this happen? <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, back in Auckland. How did this happen? <laughs> Not usually happens, is it? <laughs> After wardrobe and makeup, all of the actors move on to the Mystic set. There you go. Finished. You get the line set in the night before, although sometimes they change depending on like weather and stuff. If we're like doing an outside scene, but then all of a sudden it's like bucketing down, then we probably won't do that outside scene. Okay, so let's have Hattie down here. I give Stella more rubbish, so she Stella has something to do, because otherwise you've got nothing to do. And then I reckon you make your way down here, back toward the gang, basically so you're you're there in time to give the bag to what's his job? Gay? Okay? Yeah. All right. I think it is hard to find uh, actors who have disabilities because maybe these people are less inclined to be, have an agent or to go into casting sessions or to pursue that. But the reality is that there are roles for people with disabilities now and in fact this is what most of us producers are looking for for our shows is to show diversity and show a real world sort of situation. Oh, cut. Really Go. good. It's actually lovely having Hattie on set. She's a lot of fun. She just brings her own dynamic to the set, which everyone sort of feeds off. And she's certainly a great part of the team. And they're all pretty close to the cast, you know. They all bounce off each other and they all look after each other. So it's been a real good experience for all of us. She's quirky, she's vibrant, she's creative, she's enthusiastic. She does miss her family a lot. She's very close to mum and dad. 
And he's so shy about the whole thing and won't tell anyone, but Ruby tells everyone and, you know, is just so proud. It's just quite gorgeous, actually, you know. Yeah. Two of my friends, like, always ask me when the new episodes are coming out because they haven't came out yet. I've said to Hattie, this was an opportunity because I think, you know, about other deaf kids watching Mystic and their character. By actually doing this, you can actually improve things for other kids and normalise because actually deafness and if you can help, you should help. We're very lucky with Hattie in that Hattie is actually quite a good role model for other deaf children because they just get on and do stuff. They don't let the deafness limit what they do or what they attempt to do. Even Hattie in front of other parents can actually make some parents with younger kids sort of go, Phew. It's like probably a few people who like just treat me a little bit different than other people do just because I'm deaf. But I don't pick up on things as much. I'm quite oblivious to a lot of things. I never wanted Hattie to feel sorry for herself. And it's not because I didn't have any empathy for it being harder. I want Hattie to have a good life, and self-pity doesn't lead to a good life. We all have our stuff, and deafness is Hattie's thing, and it's about, you know, learning to live with that and have the best life possible. Hattie's impact on the rest of the family, it does make you think in terms of communication. A lot of the ways we need to communicate and be vigilant and to Hattie because of her deafness. Does it help our communication? Well, for me, I felt like my personality has completely changed. I'm a lot more stroppy than I used to, and I, actually, I really like that now, <laughs> you know? I must say, you know, I think I've got a lot more from Hattie than Hattie's ever got from me. When I think of Hattie, I don't think deaf because Hattie has so much character. Hattie's always trying to pick up the important things and sometimes you don't get that. It's really hard and it tires them out so much, but we don't see it as something that defines them. For a while now, everyone's voices are completely different to how I hear them. Like how I describe someone's voices isn't how someone else would describe their voices because of how I've been taught to describe it. Your disability isn't you. <laughs> Which like stands for, like every like other disabilities. It doesn't like define your existence. <laughs>